time now for the nationally syndicated radio show, The World of Lori Zook. And now, here she is, the smart, the sexy, the savvy, divine Miss C. And welcome to The World of Lori Zook. On this episode of Mentors and Legends, I have the privilege of speaking with big band leader Sonny LaRosa and his manager, Barbara Bickerstaff. Now, Sonny, he's a gifted trumpet player and music teacher, and after he retired from playing, he formed Sonny LaRosa's America's Youngest Jazz Band. For 30 years, he taught students up to the age of 12 how to play in the big band style, both as soloists and as a team. Now, Sonny's recently retired, and his manager, Barbara Bickerstaff, is producing a documentary about his life. So, Sonny, I want to thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start off a little bit with your, let's go through your life history. What made you decide that you wanted to become a musician? (laughs) Actually, I didn't decide. My father decided. Decided that he loved the sound of the trumpet or whatever, and... uh, Gee, I think he spoke to me about when I was four years old, you're going to play, and then he used to take me up to Harlem and hear the bands in the Apollo Theater, and uh, and uh, it was thrilling for me, and we had a joke about it because I don't know whether he took me up there to hear the great bands or see the naked colored dancers <laughs> in there, but uh, that was... Uh, <laughs> That was a joke about it, but it, it was educational for me. I, I just uh, loved to hear these big bands, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Buddy Rich. It was, it was out of this world. Now, how old were you started out, and did you start out on trumpet? Oh, yeah. I started when I was 10 years old, and that was uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> Made me laugh there, Sonny. I'm a joker, you know. <laughs> But anyway, no kidding. I started when I was 10 years old, and uh, I had qualities that were noticed by a lot of people, you know. And uh, one time that started me off uh, to get going was the sound of my trumpet was unique for some reason, I don't know. And... uh, In high school, I went to Bryan High School in Astoria, Long Island, actually where Tony Bennett lived also. And um, the school teacher said to me, she wasn't very fond of me. I I was a little kid, what did I know? And they were having a big contest for trumpet players to be in a scholarship program, if you want it or whatever, and she told this other boy, Lester, you go, I make sure you go, and I just was a little kid, and I just looked looked over, and he said, hey, she said, "Uh, uh, Anthony, you go too. I said, okay. Well, the consequence was that I won a scholarship to study with William Varchiano, the principal trumpet player in the New York Philharmonic, and I was one of the uh, recipients for that. And it was great because I came from a poor family, and this way I'd get an education uh, uh, free, more or less, and and it was wonderful, and I loved it. I loved every bit of it. Of course, there were times when it wasn't my cup of tea because (laughs) actually... uh, Bill Marciano taught the the greatest trumpet players in the world, even though the, he wasn't a jazz player. And I remember one time taking him, a, I was there going in and out of Juilliard and different, different places where I'd meet with him to have a private lesson. And the funny thing was, one time I was having a lesson with uh, with Bill, and he said... Hey, and there was a band next door, you know, a jazz band playing. And uh, he said, hey, what's all that noise? Because he said it jokingly, but that wasn't his cup of tea, but it was mine. So I said to myself, if he only knew that 
I would love to be in that band right now. It was Lee Castle. He took over the Tommy Dorsey band. And uh, I, my, you know, this whole scholarship thing was to train kids to be in the New York Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra. But my heart was in jazz. So you actually got a Juilliard scholarship, which is classical, but you you're, you were, you heard the jazz and you went, wow, that's my kind of thing, right? That's my cup of tea. Right. I loved it. You know, I loved the jazz, but don't forget, a lot of jazz players went to him for lessons also. But I think that this whole thing with scholarship, because I, I practice two and three hours a day, so he noticed that I had good technique and all, and I was a little kid, and I was very happy. And when I went back to high school, I became a, a hero because uh, you know, whoever wins a thing like that, and you know, it was just just amazing. And I, uh, I of course suffered a terrible uh, something or other because I was short. You know, Laurie, I had a, I was four foot eight or something, or whatever it was, and because I joined the band, and uh, William Bryan, Bryan College, uh High School, it knocked my uh, program all around, and all my friends went to different classes. So, sure enough, I walk into my first class and everybody roared, left, because a little kid, and it was a senior class. They got me mixed up in something, and it started to hurt me, and I, I got so discouraged, and that, and that was a part of my life I really disliked. And, of course, later on, I got with the... It's almost like being like a... <laughs> having a mafia with you, you know. I, I When kids would make fun of me and uh, I'd go home crying or whatever, I it hurt so badly. And then one day I was playing in the hallway before going into band rehearsal, and uh, two of these tough guys came over and said, Hey, hey, kid, let's say you play Cherub or Ben. Now, of course, that was Harry James' big thing. And I started to blow, and then he said, how about Sleepy Lagoon? I played them all, and they they became my guardians. I went, I went around, I was so happy, because now instead of wishing I was dead at times, I felt like somebody, and, and they made sure that nobody would offend me in any way. And it was thrilling for me to, to have that type of guidance. Yeah, it sounds like you became their hero. Yeah, I, 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 I just felt good about everything, and I wasn't laughed upon, you know, because if they, if they did, these guys would straighten them out. <laughs> it, was, it was fun, and I, but I suffered a lot in those first uh, years, and I wished I had never played in, at one time. But then they had me on its stage playing solos and everything else, so I... I uh, became somebody, and that's what I wanted to be. So, you know, my horn meant everything to me, you know. Uh, Schoolwork didn't mean anything, and I, my father used to stick up me instead of, he used to say, tell him you're a trumpet player, you're not a scholar or anything like that. Sure, that was okay, but when I failed the English Regents and I didn't get out of school, and I, I, got, I went into the army instead, but I, but I, I got an army, dip, uh, you know, a diploma uh, from that, and it was a, a time in my life. I just, I practiced so much though, so hard, and worked very hard, and I had a lot of heartaches, a lot of things that weren't great, but uh, and then came along this idea of a small band. And I was in, uh, I was in living in South O Long Island, and I said I started working with kids, teaching them, and I said, gee, it would be nice if I had a little band. And you know why? I said to myself, I never had this. I wanted to play in a band for crying out loud, but they never had kids to play in. 
you know, could play this stuff or whatever. So when I decided to come to Florida in 1978, I gave it one year, Lori, one year leaving my family to give it a try. There was a man named Tom Rollison who said, Sonny, I think you could make it here. He was a neighbor of mine in New York. And I, I always loved Florida. I always said it's going to be great until I joined the Army and, and the infantry. And I said, boy, this isn't so hot. But anyway, but as far as uh, uh, starting a band, and I went slow. And, of course, they were terrible. And I had flutes and any anything. In fact, I, I lived there with this wonderful friend of mine, Tom, he gave me a chance to get started, and I started to play with, uh, started to get an idea what these kids could do, and that was nothing. They couldn't play anything. They had no con uh, conception, and I said, let me see if I can change that. And it took a while, but every once in a while, some kid would come up and i say, hey, this kid can do it, and vocalizing Laura, you take a kid that comes in and they sing something in the way she moved. Da, 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 da. And I said, no, let's do something in the way that she moves me. Get a little feeling. And they start listening. I said, listen to the great singers. Well, of course, my whole life was based on playing trumpet, of course, but not listening to trumpet players, listen to vocalists. And the main guy was Frank Sinatra. I said, I'm going to play my horn like Frank Sinatra sings. And I did. But nobody really cared when I, when I took the kids out. In fact, let's go back when, when, I, when I had uh, this uh, whole year in uh, starting this band in a little uh, parochial school called St. Cecilia's in Clearwater, Florida. And uh, I started to, uh, you know, get these kids going, and it was murder, you know, and uh, you, you, you tell them, try this, try that. And then, of course, you put up with the Little League stuff. Why isn't my kid singing? Why isn't he playing? He's in the band. Oh, okay, Mrs. Jones. There's no reason why you shouldn't hear what he can do. We'll have a rehearsal Saturday, and let's hear him. We'll give him a chance. Sure enough, he comes in, he takes a trumpet, and he plays. That Sometimes I'd pop, bing, and it sounded terrible. I didn't have to say anything. The mother says, oh. But what I did, Laurie... I never turned the kid down. I said, this kid will get something. I'll get him to sing if he can sing. Sure enough, he got a, he got a, and I started to break him into sing or uh, play a little something to keep him interested so he doesn't lose, you know, his figure, gee, I'm nothing. I never turned away a kid. I turned away the parents sometimes who tried to get me to have them take over the band. This was wild because they saw things happening. And uh, we started playing, and uh, the big break came. And, uh, well, first of all, uh, the funny thing was when I when I started teaching in, uh, in uh, Safety Harbor, whatever it was, Clearwater, and a friend of mine, a trumpet player, had been there before, and he said, Hey, Sonny, how you doing? With the teaching, he said, gee, I'm only here four months. He says, and I got eight trumpet students already. So he said, how many do you have? And I felt kind of funny. I said, gee, I'm not going to be a wise guy. I said, 80. He said, you have 80 kids? But, of course, I was going to homes. I spent from going to St. Petersburg to Tarpon Springs teaching in homes, which most Never heard of in that at that time. There was no teaching at homes. There was no no. In fact, there was marching bands, marching bands, and I said I'm going to get these kids to play with a 
a feeling of jazz and and to love it. And we had a lot of fun. It was it was great. And of course, like I say, there were drawbacks. One woman said, "We're going to start something, Sonny. We'll have a, a meeting with all the parents and the kids." And I said, "Oh, yeah, that's a good idea." And uh, she went on to say, "Now, we should have a president, a vice president, and Sonny, you'll be treasurer." <laughs> and I said to myself, "What's going on here? I mean, like uh, a treasurer? I started something that I'm, I'm supposed to be great at, and uh, and it's, things are coming around." So other people were trying to take over. Yeah, well, there was a lot of people that once knew that this would be a, a good thing, but they didn't know what it entailed, the, the heartaches and the, the things, and the uh, parents giving you a hard time. Or, in fact, I remember. Uh, Going into, uh, well, a big thing was an invite to the uh, big Switzerland thing, Montreux Jazz Festival. Supposed to be the best, uh, biggest festival in the world. So I put in a bid for it, and the guy says, hey, do we, you, you what I'm looking for? I said, wonderful. The band drew $50,000 from people who wanted to see us get there. And uh, I was so happy about that. And then there was a woman who, I don't know, for some reason sent out a thing saying, do you realize our kids could, should be paid for this? Uh, and I'm saying to myself, and one guy said, what are you bringing this up now? She's passing stuff out at the table when we're getting all the info on going to Switzerland. And... Uh, it, it hurt me terribly because I, at this age, 52, don't laugh, Lori. <laughs> okay. No, oh, I'm 89. I'll be 90, and I hope Barbara gets my, my I always say I hope she gets that great uh, life story done before I hit, you know, before I'm not around. But anyway, going back to that. We, we had a, a great time, and uh, people uh, looked to, you know, put me down, and that hurt, you know. And uh, we got there. We, of course, we made a great hit. And uh, I just was so proud of the kids, and there were great celebrities there, you know, great uh, people playing, and when they hear kids do this, they, like you, you had mentioned that you... Uh, Lori, that you said you didn't believe they were, believe they were kids, and I heard that all the time. But as it, as I, I kept teaching them, it got better and better. And of course, I didn't want flutes. What do I need? I can have a, somebody play a flute solo, but and I started to take kids out of the band, but kept the ones who were stars, who had something. And the greatest things in my life today, or reward for all this, is that. I have quite a few kids who who made it nationally, and they've been all over the world. Eric Darris was one of them, and uh, it's just amazing, and it made me feel good that I'm starting to accomplish something. And I never, I never really had any trouble with the band. Of course, uh, it's the parents; they get crazy. One woman said. Uh, he just made his bar mitzvah, and it, uh, they said he sang so great. And picture yourself not giving him a chance. Well, for crying out loud, if you sing with with no feeling, and what what good is it for my band? You know, I I have nothing. Right. Well, that's where the the stars stand out. There's a big difference when when you're playing an instrument. Some people just play by rote. There's no feeling. Well, done through the horn. And your friend Glenn Zatola, you know, Glenn. Uh, mentioned that you sing through your horn, and that's what you taught children how to do. So can you explain what singing through the horn is? Well, Glenn Zatola changed my whole life. First of all, Lori, I my whole life was trumpet, really, you know. And I, one kid said to me one time, well, Sonny, what are you playing in the band? It's a kid's band. So I said to this, I used to play a couple of tunes with them at the concert. And I said, uh, 
Yeah, maybe he's right. Uh, so I stopped it for a while. And an old lady came up to me one time, several of them, and said, why don't you play with the band sometime? And I said, oh, well, and so I... Now, here's what happened. You talk about Glenn Zatola. I met him in a music store, and he was going to help me with a few things of where to rehearse. And then uh, he lived in uh, Florida, and then he, he moved, of course. And I said, you know something, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show, uh, tell and show Glenn with my CD, and maybe he'll say something. Say something. He wrote that in Facebook, and he said, I'd like to make publicly, I hope I get it straight, that Sonny La Rosa is the best sounding trumpet I've heard, ever heard. And kudos to him or whatever it was. And I said, well, could this be possible? A guy that I admired so much say that I was a great trumpet player and the best he's ever heard with this kind of a sound and style. So I started to flip over my plan. I said to myself, hey, maybe I'm pretty good. So I, I uh, made this record. Uh, well, the one I sent him was uh, The Haunting Sounds. It was uh, something. He claimed that uh, he and I had the same type of feeling. We wanted to play like a singer would sing. Now, there's a marvelous trumpet players. I love every one of them. But they, they love to play those high notes. All right, that's great, you know. But I said, I want to play like Frank sings. And that's what I did. And I, and I got a kick out of that. And uh, first of all, I probably couldn't even play those high You take a guy like Doc Severance, it's marvelous. And uh, all these trumpet players. But then they all started to play improvising. Improvising is great. Well, sometimes you say, where is the melody or whatever. Right. And, People uh, go too far out, off track sometimes and, and they lose the listeners. Right. And uh, Barbara said to me one time, and uh, she said to me, you know something? I'm writing a, st a story about you, but I I listened to that. Uh, her favorite was uh, Angel Eyes. And she, she said, I've been listening to that, and that is beautiful. And she kept it up, and I said, gee, even she likes it. I said, what's going to happen here? I'm... So I felt so great about all that, but I, I, I cleansed the total, started that. And I I feel bad. I, I'd like other guys. I have a, a, about 10 people who made wonderful remarks. And I was trying to find somebody who would, you know, listen to, but then it's kind of corny, you know, for... I, I'm going to make <laughs> ask Barbara to start sending them out to different people. You know, some people might say, you know, I, I haven't had any any bad remarks about them, only good. So it, it was good. So maybe I can get her to send it to somebody and it don't make me feel like I'm blowing my own horn. I don't want to be a wise guy, but, gee, I, I love the trumpet more than anything. And I used to play for the kids, play it this way, you know, or sing it this way. And that's how I got the band to sound so great. Right. And when you sing through your horn, it basically the instrument becomes an extension of your own body and soul. Oh. And that's the difference, I think, between the people that are prodigies and play so well because it's part of them as opposed to someone where it's a separate thing and they're just blowing into it. But I want you to I want you to stay with us. We're going to go to a quick break. But on the way out, we're going to play some bumper music. We're going to play you playing Angel Eyes. Great. Thank you. 
Are your credit reports a mess? Are debt collectors hounding you? Maybe you're in foreclosure or headed towards foreclosure and don't know where to turn. It's time to stop panicking. Take back control of your life. Make the first step by calling Credit Education Consultants today at 813-500-6064. That's 813-500-6064. Mention the word radio for a free 15-minute consultation. Don't delay. Call today. Welcome back to the world of Lori Zook. I have got a wonderful guest today, Sonny LaRosa. And he had Sonny LaRosa's America's Youngest Jazz Band. And I have his manager, Barbara Bickerstaff, here. And we're going to be speaking to her a little bit later in the program. And we just came back. That music you heard leading in was Imagination, right, Sonny? Is a what? Imagination. That the tune, yeah. So yes. I, well, I love that. <laughs> no matter what tune I I, I, I played my, my horn, Lori, I... I heard Frank Sinatra, you know, and a funny thing <laughs> that happens, things happen in your life. My my wife's aunt knew uh, Tony Bennett very well, and uh, she said to me, write, write to Tony Bennett and tell him, you know, see, if, 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 and he was at Ruth Eckett Hall, so I wrote him a note, and I didn't think he'd answer, and he called my wife's aunt, and he said, oh, and I had a picture of her with Tony Bennett that said, if it wasn't for you, I would have never made it where I am today. And I mentioned all that, and then he, we were his guests at Ruth Eckett Hall, and we didn't have any problem getting back. <laughs> so here we go in, and Tony says, Mary, how are you? Uh, oh, you know, talking a little bit about old times. Then they said, and she said, oh, Tony, I want you to meet my nephew, Sonny. He loves Frank Sinatra. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I said, hey, Mary, what are you doing? You know, but I didn't say anything. And of course, he probably blew it off, but who who wants to hear that, you know, <laughs> but it was a joke, and I kept, the, I have a pictures home of us uh, uh, together, but that was funny, <clears throat> but it could have hurt, too, who knows, maybe uh, he, he could have helped my band a lot, and uh, that was one of the things that I, I got a kick out of, the, uh, the best, uh, you know, we, I took the kids all over. We had a, a, we played five years in a row, Laurie, for a thing called the March of Jazz, and that was with the best musicians in the world. I got to know them all. I got to, and and the kids should know. And of course, they're kids, not kids now, but they realize that they had been part of this documenting life story that Barbara is creating, they should realize that they're part of all this and they played with the greatest musicians in the world. I'm talking about um, <laughs> the best. And uh, and I met them all and I loved them all and we had a lot of fun. And f I was hired by Matt Domber and his wife, Rachel, great people, five years in a row with my name right on the front cover with the best musicians in the world. How could I not love what I do and uh, what I have done? And uh, and they all, and we used to stand around, Doc Severinsen or uh, so many wonderful guys from The Tonight Show, and they'd all say the same thing. Hey, how do you, how do, you do this? How do you make the kids do it? I wish I had that when I was a kid. And that's the thing they said every time we played 
someplace, and I talk to uh, uh, most, a lot of the fellas are deceased now, but the, the Kenny Devane used to say to me, gee, how do you get the kids to play like that? I mean, wish I had that when I was a kid. So I was happy about it. How could you not be? And uh, having all these wonderful artists. And it went on and different, and we went to Montreal Jazz Festival in Switzerland on main stage, uh, things that made me happy. And, of course, there were, like I say, it always has to be some headaches with this. And But you know what the funny thing, Laurie? Everybody wanted to do it. Oh, yeah, so... Guys would write to me, hey, I saw what Nat Hentorf wrote about you in the uh, Wall Street Journal. He said that uh, you should be uh, an inspiration to every musician in the world for what you've done. And I felt, I felt great about it. And, uh, and every time, I, like I say, I, I played these things and I shook hands with these fellows and talked to them. And then you'd see him the next night on the TV on uh, the Tonight Show. Uh, I never got on the Tonight Show. Um, hey, I'm not that great, and you know I'm great, Laurie. I do know you're great. Oh, okay. I think you're incredible, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the funny thing was, Laurie? Though a lot of guys said to me, my fellow, uh, you know, the parents of the kids, is say, you know what you are, Sonny. You're you're a, a, a comedian. You're a stand-up comedy uh, comic, and, and and you have the ability to be a showman. And I said, you know something? That he's right. I used to send out little cards to the people in the audience, and not only sent it out in cards because I I want them to write back, but. I wouldn't be able to hear them that well anyway. My hearing was starting to conk out. But anyway, they send up a card, and I, I like I'd say, uh, like I always kid around with them, who was known as the king of swing? One guy raised his hand. Benny Goodman. Good. Who was the, you know, so-and-so. And we'd go on and on, and I said, you know, whoever get, makes all these things right is going to get a wonderful gift from the kids in the band because it's it's amazing that you knew that Count Basie was the best type of jazz band around and all so when the time came to give a I said hey this guy over here stand up and he'd stand up and I said you know you knew all the answers to everything you were great and the people said give him a little applause now you're going to get the the award, and you deserve it. And I'd say, we're going to give you not one ticket, two tickets by plane straight to Afghanistan. And everybody roared, you know. <laughs> and then I had to add, when you get there, stay in there, please. And I used to kid with people like that. I That was my life with the band. And uh, nobody well, objected. And I got to jump in here because I read I read a funny story that said you were fired at least five times due to your humorous <laughs> antics in Chuck Foster's band. What did you do? Well, I joined the band. I lived in New York, of course, and I auditioned for Chuck Foster's band, who was a semi-name band, but who worked the best spots. And I auditioned at the New Yorker Hotel. I said, gee, what's better than playing here? He does three months here instead of one night. It's every year, so it would be wonderful. And uh, he offered me the job, and I was to meet the band in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And, of course, uh, it was weird because as I walked into the... Uh, lobby or whatever it was, and when I got off the plane, I saw signs that said white, black restaurant, restroom, and I came from a, from a place where we never even, th I said, what is, what is this all about? And it hurt me, you know, and I said, ah, and sure enough, it faded, 
And uh, and another funny thing when I moved down here, I hope I'm not getting away off the subject, but I have to. These things come to me. I was riding along here, uh, and uh, going toward uh, Tarman Springs. I drive and I see a sign, Ku Klux Klan. I said, what, what, "Did I come into a nut house or something?" But as it went on. It faded away, and all these chains, everything came. And getting back to the band, and uh, like I say, I I met so many wonderful musicians and so many people that had faith in me, and uh, it was just a great feeling. I, I, I couldn't ask for anything better. And I said, gee, at my age. So I'm just praying now that Barbara gets her documentary and life story through before I hit 90. But I figured, ah, like I told you when you, maybe I'll go to 100. Well, you know what we're going to do on that mention with Barbara? What I'd like to do is ask Barbara a few questions about the documentary. Barbara Bickerstaff, thank you very much for, for joining me. It's great to be here. And I want to talk a bit about Sonny's band, the America's Youngest Jazz Band. You are pulling together a documentary about his life. So would you would you share a little bit about what you're doing? Okay. Uh, I'm a promoter. And I've worked uh, diligently with young children in the past and have produced uh, television, national television shows and actually uh, did some talent scouting. So I know, I'm not talented myself, mind you. I try to be at times. <laughs> well, you must be talented and, at what you do. And Sonny so. has pulled a few songs out of me, but that's about it. And, uh, but when I hear good talent, and my hair, uh, on my arms stand up on my, my arms, I say, okay, uh, this is good. And uh, I, I went to one of his concerts, and uh, I couldn't believe it because I thought I was going to hear Mary Had a Little Lamb and, you know, that kind of thing for from young kids. And I just had to be a part of this, and I wondered how I would do that. And this wonderful woman, Julie Goodman, had been the spokeswoman for his band for many years. And uh, at the end of the at the end of the uh, concert, she said, "If anybody would like to help, please come forth." And about a week later, I gave it some thought, and I called Sonny, and I asked if you know we could meet and uh, what I could do to help. And as I walked in his office. I saw all these pictures all over his office. And I thought, wow, there's a story here to be told. And uh, so he, I found out he hadn't been noticed or recognized in his own backyard. So I went to the mayor, Ayub, at the time, young mayor, and I said, look, do you, do you have any idea who Sonny is? And so he said, because he's young. And so uh, I told him, Google it all up. And, and you'll find out. So anyway, we gave Sonny a big event, bringing in Eric Darius as uh, a special guest. And we had a proclamation uh, on June 15th is Sonny La Rosa Day. And the mayor also had him light the tree for Christmas time. And, and he led out in the parade as the Grand Marshal, and so we accomplished the fact that he needed to be noticed in his backyard. Now, as I talked with Sonny, uh, he told me bits and pieces of his story as a young person, as he was growing up, and all the twists and turns just to try to get this band in the works. And I called up Apollo Productions, who is now my director, Troy Bowman. Very creative. The, the man is a genius. And uh, 
I said, Troy, this this is what I want to do, because I've known Troy for a long time, but I hadn't talked to him for a period of time. He said, yes. Yeah. So he uh, came out, we talked, and we went over some things, and he said... I said, gee, do you know Spielberg by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> he says, I don't know if we can go that far, Barb, but uh, we'll, we'll do this. And so right away, we uh, interviewed Sonny. We, we've done a lot in the last year and a half. And now we're into the reenactments. And we work with actors and actresses. And we're just having a lot of fun getting this together. Troy is now on a little vacation, very deserving of it. When he comes back, we're going to be doing some heavy editing at okay. that time. And now this is called The Ambassador of Jazz, correct? Ambassador of Jazz. And how do you think that this film can help children? And maybe I can kind of answer that just coming from the musical background. I grew up in northern New Jersey, in the New York metro area, where music is still a big thing. Mm-hmm. But when you live in an area here where it's not a major metro area, then music is not necessarily in the schools until the kids are older. And I think the most touching thing when I watched the DVD was to see such young children. Maybe I saw kids on that DVD, eight, nine years old, that growled through their horns. Or, you know, the kids used the mutes or they got up and exactly as he was describing, you know, he wanted it like Frank Sinatra. That's what these kids, they had style and class. And not only were they independent soloists, but they were a, co- a cohesive unit working together as a team. And that's so rare to see because I, I had to close my eyes and, eyes and go, these sound like adult professional performers, and yet they are young children. So do you think it's going to influence uh, children who are watching this, you know, maybe to aspire to something in music? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, Sonny has worked with children that come in and they don't know really about mary had a little lamb and he says you got to sing you have to play that horn or a saxophone whatever they're playing like like you hear it sung i i just admire sonny for the way he brings, it's so simplified the way he does it, but how he brings this out in young children that are four years old, that's never heard of jazz in their life. This one little girl, four years old, stayed with the band until he retired. She walks out on the stage. She has all her little curls and a great big bow on the back of her head. He picks her up, sits her on the stool, (laughs) and she sings her song. What was the name of the song, Sonny? uh, Peggy Lee's song. Do right or? Yes. Okay. Plenty money back in 20. Right. Oh, cute one, right. And then at the end of the song, she'll say, Give me some money, Sonny. (laughs) <laughs> and then he throws the money up in the air and she gets down off the stool and picks all the money up yeah it, but it, it, it reminds me of the 19 the 1940s exactly. when you watch the old films and those were the times of the real andrew actors. scissor right. sisters and, and you name it right the kids were brought out to sing like that and to play like that and if you were to close your eyes you'd think it was dorsey or what are the big bands playing now, what do you do as far as funding this documentary? Oh, How what do you an do undertaking this has been to get funding. I think Sonny <laughs> stays up all night just thinking about who he could talk to to help fund this. And it, he has raised a lot of funds through do, uh, donations. And what you can do here, what we've also, uh, the, the classics, um, Al Downing's association, uh, the different uh, associations have helped to raise funds for us. Um, right now, what we can do, what you can do is uh, the checks have got to be payable to Ambassador of Jazz. 
that's ambassador of jazz. Not to Sonny La Rosa, <laughs> not to Barbara Bickersett, but ambassador of jazz. And that's to uh, address it to Sonny La Rosa, 130 Forest Lane, Safety Harbor, Florida. It's 130 Forest Lane, Safety Harbor, Florida, 34695. Or they can go under Ambassador of Jazz, GoFundMe. Right, we if they go to go, go GoFundMe.com. Me. Right. right. Well, I think, I think what you're doing is tremendous, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it when it comes out. Um, what do you appreciate most personally about working with Sonny? Well, I, I really admire his trumpet playing. I'm sorry, that's a personal thing. I could listen to Sonny's haunted sounds all day long and never get tired of it. At first, when I heard it, I thought, oh, okay, I just need a glass of wine, sit back and chill out, and just go there. And uh, his, his playing is crystal clear, crystal clear. A lot of the, a lot of the players today uh, go off, do their own thing, what you hear Sonny play is the actual song. Right, okay. and, I, and I understand that. You hear that. the right. song. The, it's not... I, th- I think sometimes maybe the, the trumpeters can't keep that crystal clear sound going. So they go off and play different things, and then they come back to the right. the tune itself. I call that off on a tangent. They go right. so far out into outer space that, that you've you now lost the melody, know. and Where you don't know what song it is. Song? Right. Where? Give me the song. And Sonny does that so well. And uh, I also admire his uh, creativity. And when I watch him work with the kids, now, mind you, he has worked with a uh, a young man that had seizures, and he, this this fella actually went to the doctor. The doctor said to him, "Whatever you're doing, and you're playing in that band, you stay in that band for a long time because it's helping with your seizures." And if that if that uh, fella uh, has a, had a seizure on stage, he just uh, walk off stage. Then he'd come back after he had the seizure. But that was a rare thing. That was a rare thing. He used to have many, many seizures during the day, but because of his music, that that was eliminated. Right. And now he's going to school and college. And another young fellow, the mother comes to him. He says, Sonny, I have tried different times to, to get him to play the saxophone and taken him here and there. Could you help him and Sonny said yes I can so this young boy not only learned how to play the saxophone well he also would get up he had a social problem uh, big time and he'd get up and sing his mother said I never dreamed he would ever be able to get up and sing a song in front of an audience yeah, tremendous talent. Like I said, when I watched that DVD, and you know, the other thing I noticed too is all the kids said, we have to attend every practice. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a key thing. I think sometimes parents think, oh, I'm just going to send my kid whenever, and they're going to turn out to be a prodigy. And it doesn't work that way. If you listen, we listened to Sonny earlier talking about he practiced several hours a day to be able to get to where he was. But he also had the gift of music too and that's separate he had the talent he had the aptitude and he did the practicing and i think those three things together combined is kind of what he inspired into these young children because when you see these little kids get up and there was one child who got up and sang a song and played trombone and another one who got up and sang into trumpet and switched back and forth and i went these are 30 year old souls inside eight and nine year old children that are getting up to do this and i think it was amazing and i want to thank you very much for answering all of my questions. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Sonny, I've done a lot of research on you, and, you know, I didn't know as much about you before as I did. And what really 
just made me have the wow factor was watching that DVD and watching how you had to inspire young children. Because as a music teacher myself, I know what it takes individually to try to motivate and inspire someone. But you did this with like 20 students and not only individually, but you did it as, as a group. And I, my last question to you is what, what did it make you feel like, or what does it make you feel like to know that you inspired so many children? Wow. What? It brought me the greatest happiness in the world. How many people at my age and what Barbara's doing for me, it happens, you know, but, uh, you know, what I what bothers me is not bothers me, but I can't understand. Do you know, Lori, that between five and six hundred kids walk through that band? I mean, or I taught; they were students of mine, and uh, I I love to hear from them. And sometimes they just. Yeah, I don't hear from them, you know, and uh, when I do, they say, oh, Sonny, and we have books, Barbara has them, with hundreds of wonderful ah, love stories. Sonny did this for me, did that. Right. And, and sometimes I feel that they've put me aside, but I don't think it's so. I'm going to see, and I hate I hate this. I never wanted to, to say, send me a donation. No, but that, that's fine. I think that's fine that you did that because what you what you did was you inspired and you're continuing the, to inspire people by doing this. And there's nothing wrong with asking for, for donations. What you did was tremendous. And we're out of time, but I want to thank you so much today for coming, for sharing your story. And join me, Lori Zook, next week on The World of Lori Zook. Oh, thank you so much, Lori. And would you mind if I didn't bother with going on your motorcycle? No problem. I'll take you next time. How's but, that? But I love you anyway. I love you too. <laughs> Stop.